welcome back to St Helen's training and our Bible overview. We left the Bible story at the end of the Old Testament waiting, waiting for God to step in and save. And it turns out to be a long wait. As Daniel was warned, kingdoms would come and go before the Son of Man, the, the Saviour King, would come. And so it's a huge moment when over 400 years later, the New Testament opens with the announcement of Jesus Christ. Although I wonder if you've ever opened Matthew's Gospel, the first page of our New Testament, and felt like it's an anticlimax, a genealogy, surely the most boring introduction to the most exciting event in human history. Well, not if you know the Bible overview. You see, genealogies take on a whole new significance when you're looking out for the rescue plan. We know we need a serpent crusher. We know we're looking in the family of Abraham, and it has to be someone in the line of David. And so there's a whole new significance to the first verse of Matthew. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew wants us to know that the promised rescuer is here. The promised blessing is coming. And that's a great example of the benefits of knowing an overview. The New Testament is written in the vocabulary of the Old Testament. The Old Testament sets up the categories we need to understand Jesus. So priest, sacrifice, saviour, king, redeemer. All of those things are introduced in the Old Testament. If we want to understand them and see the significance of them, we're to go back there for the definition. In another example, Mark's Gospel opens by quoting Isaiah. He says, A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. It's his way of saying, the rescue is on. The Lord is coming. He's stepping in to save. This is the true return from exile. But actually, in our Bible overview, we look at Luke. After chapters 1 to 2 have made it clear that a big moment is here. The salvation from sin has come. The king has arrived. Well, then chapters 3 and 4 announce Jesus as the Son of God. Again, using our Old Testament background, that name rings bells. Son of God is a title. It's given to three key Old Testament figures. So as the first created being, Adam is a son of God. And Luke definitely wants us to remember that because he's put a genealogy of Adam right next to Jesus. But son was also a title given to the Davidic king. In Psalm 2, God said of the king, You are my son, today I've begotten you. And it's a title given to Israel. In Exodus, God said to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go that he may serve me. So then Adam, Israel, the Davidic kings, they're all called sons of God. And they all have one other thing in common, failure. They all failed to be true servants and worshippers of God. They all fell into sin, failing to be the true son. But Jesus is different. He is a new humanity, the only person to ever walk the earth, living with God as God, truly treating the Father as he deserves, loving him with all his heart. As the Father says at the baptism, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. And I'm sure Luke wants us to be comparing with Jesus, with Adam and Israel. Because straight after the genealogy, Jesus takes, uh, is taken into the wilderness, the place of Israel's repeated failure, and he's tempted by the devil, just as Adam was. In fact, the issue is the same initially, food. Jesus is starving, the devil offers him bread, but this son, unlike the others, trusts the Lord even when his stomach says otherwise. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. The second issue is idolatry. Satan offering Jesus a better life, a kingdom without the cross, if he would just worship this creature, not God. But again, Jesus takes us back to Deuteronomy, where Israel failed and says, you shall worship the Lord your God, him only shall you serve. The point is clear. Jesus is being tested in just the ways that Adam and Israel and the Davidic kings failed. And the amazing thing is, he stands. 
the first man in human history to not buckle before the devil's temptation, the first leader not to fail in loving the Lord with all his heart. He is the one who can fulfill the Mosaic Covenant. Maybe this is the one that can crush the serpent, the one who can sit on the throne in justice. He is the innocent servant, leading the life we should have, dying the death we deserve. And as the Gospels roll on, well, it becomes clear that Jesus is indeed the divine Davidic king. He is the suffering servant, the greater sacrifice than animals, the greater priest than Aaron, and he's bringing the spirit to cleanse us and change our hearts. And so, though his death on the cross may seem like the greatest moment of weakness, Isaiah described that we would esteem him not, we'd consider him stricken. But actually, it is the centre of the rescue plan. It is the cross that bridges the gap from the exile, the curse that we deserve, up to the blessings, the new creation, being part of God's people, with him for us, that he deserved. It's a huge moment. It is the climax of the rescue plan, as the son takes the curse on himself. The real problem, the sin problem, has been solved for all who trust in Jesus. But it leaves a big question. Why are we still here? Why are we still here? If the king has come, why aren't we experiencing a perfect world? Why is this world still a mess? Why are God's enemies still at large, still ignoring him, still abusing his people, still using his world? Why hasn't the king brought the justice that Isaiah promised? It's actually a really good question. I think the prophets would have been asking it from what they could see. It's a question that Jesus gets asked. The demons ask him, why have you arrived before the time? Are you going to destroy us? The disciples ask him, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, this, I think, is a huge part of what the New Testament is explaining. You see, Jesus, the promised king, actually comes twice. At his first coming to die in shame, opening the doors to the kingdom, and at his second coming to return in glory as a judge of the living and the dead. The way Peter puts it in Acts 2, as Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, is that we're now in the last days. That is, this age of the church, the time we now find ourselves. It begins with Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and will end when he returns in judgment. And this is an overlap time. In some ways, we're already saved. Sin has been forgiven and paid for. We have been given the spirit and a new heart. We are a new creation. But we are still in bodies of sin and in a world of sin. There's a now and not yet experience to these last days. But why have them at all? If the rescue has happened, why not go straight to the new creation if sin has been paid for? Well, because God is patient to give people a chance to hear of the rescue and put their trust in Jesus. Peter later, in uh, his second letter, explains that God doesn't want people to perish, so is holding off the return of his son so that more individuals can put their trust in him. This is the time for the gospel to go to all nations. That begins in Acts 10. And it is the great mission that Jesus gave to the church. You see, Jesus didn't come to make this world a better place. He came to rescue us for a new creation. And the job he gave to his church wasn't to make this world a more comfortable place for me or my community, but to make disciples of Jesus, to make people who are ready to meet him when he comes in judgment. And so there are two applications that are huge throughout the New Testament for Christians. The first is to make sure that we make it to the end. After all, if God is rescuing people from sin and the curse by a lamb for the new creation, well, the rescue isn't finished. We're not there yet. In fact, Hebrews compares the church to Israel in the desert. That is, we've been pulled out of Egypt, out of this world, but we're not yet home. We're not in the promised land. 
And so the writer says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. We're not to harden our hearts to God's voice, but to stick with Jesus until he takes us home. But the second huge application is not to store up treasure in this world, but instead invest in heaven, in the new creation, in the perfect world to come. In practice, that means encouraging others to join us there. The Bible story is a rescue story. God is about getting a people from sin and the curse to the new creation. And the question is, if that's what the Bible's about and what God's about, if that's the mission he's given to his church, well, is it what my life's about as well? Thanks for joining us.